Hey everyone, welcome again to the Rotten Horror Picture Show, the horror movie podcast where we talk about movies off of the Rotten Tomatoes 200 Best Horror Movies of All Time list. My name is Clay and with me as always is Amanda. Amanda, how are you doing? Good, how are you doing? Not too bad, not too bad. We've hit uh, a uh, wild card week. We, uh, we'll yes. be doing an, a movie that is not on our list. It was a movie chosen by Amanda. Amanda, <laughs> would you like to tell us what this movie was? Uh, this movie is uh, a dark song. I think it this came out is in 2016. Dark song, making dogs bark. Oh. Song. Um, <laughs> yes, it's dark song from 2016. Very so, nice. this is an interesting movie for me because I'm very excited to hear how much you hate this movie. No, it's well, we can get into that in a bit, but it's not on the list. Mm-hmm. But it has a 92% Rotten Tomato score, which is higher than most yeah. of the movies that are on the list. Yeah. And if you look it up, it has pretty much universal praise from pe- yes. anybody who brings it up. It's 92% critic score, um, 60%, I believe a 60% audience score, which is still pretty good. I mean, obviously, there's a bit of a disparity there, but it's it's not right. like 30% <laughs> or anything like that. Um, and, uh, yeah, I had seen this previously. I forgot that I had seen it, but mm-hmm. I don't think I had watched the entire thing. I think I might have either turned it off or like ha- had to leave it and just never came back to it. Cause it didn't really land with me. Um, hmm. and so when we got, when I got to the last like 15 <laughs> minutes or so of this movie, I, I did not remember that at all. Yeah. So I was all I remembered from this movie was the guy screaming at the woman and the woman being essentially tortured for for like an hour. Yep. So it it just I, the first time I watched it it didn't really um super land with me. So this was kind of like half a new experience. Interesting. So I was I was happy to watch it again. What what's your background with this? This was your choice. Uh <laughs> I stumbled on this movie one night at my mom's house on, like, Mm -hmm. Netflix or something. And my mom and I decided to watch it. So I watched this for the first time with my mother. Okay. (laughs) Which is, you know, it's a fun, fun little lighthearted movie for a nice mother-daughter evening with a bottle of Mm. wine. Um, And I, I just, I don't know, it's one of those movies that it ticks certain boxes that I really enjoy. Sure, sure. So it just is kind of stuck with me as something that both plays with a lot of kind of typical horror movie tropes, but is also very different than I think anything else I've ever seen. Mm, that's 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 a pretty good summation, I think. So mm. uh, we're going to take a quick break, play the trailer for you, and then we will come back and talk about a dark song. <laughs> done this three times once it worked twice it didn't i have to hear his voice again this is your last chance to back out seal it you do know what we're taking on a shift in consciousness becoming one with the ceremony pure and may all my transgressions be washed this is real stuff we're playing with Real angels, real demons. Make me trust you. How do we know that it started? You'll see it soon enough. May my light be here now. May protecting me. Drink it! Just remember who's paying for this. You don't know the ritual! No. You agreed to do whatever I said. Sorry. Sorry, Mr. Solomon. Sorry, Mr. Solomon. Take off your jeans. And may all my transgressions be washed. And my transgressions be washed. And make me chaste and pure. Washed and chaste and pure. Make me chaste and pure. May my light be here now. May my light be here. May my light guiding me. Guiding me. Protecting me. Protecting me. Protecting me. I know. And may all my transgressions be washed. And make me 
of our rage. Embrace it. Don't fear it. May my light be here now, guiding me. No, 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 don't cross the line. We'll be stuck here forever. Maybe we should stop. We can't stop. I need you to be driven. Dark Song from 2016, written and directed by Liam Gavin. It's the only movie he's directed up to this point. He's directed a bunch of shorts, this movie, and two episodes of uh, Haunting of Bly Manor. And that's pretty much it. Um, Starring Catherine Walker, Steve Oram, pretty much nobody else, (laughs) and the scariest monster of all time, Infected Wounds. Mm Mm-hmm. Amanda, what happens in a dark song? Sophia has rented a house in the middle of nowhere, and she has paid extra money so that no questions are asked. Her only companion will be Michael Solomon, which I think is wrong. Is it Michael? Anyway, uh, an occultist who must help Sophia contact her deceased son. All right. I thought his name was Joseph for some reason, but... It is Joseph. I don't know why... It says Michael. <laughs> I don't know. These pre-written summaries, I gotta ditch them. Well, Clay. Yes. Some things you will find in this movie include Paul Ginger Motti. Mm-hmm. A one star guest rating on Airbnb. <laughs> Paul Ginger Motti gives her the worst glass of wine to drink, I think, uh possible. It's a very, <laughs> very bad version of sideways in this movie. <laughs> Um, an uh, an amazing caftan. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. His whole his whole ritual outfit is just perfect. Um, pea soup, literal pea soup, <laughs> and of course, questionable parenting. Yep, not getting away from it in this movie. Oh no, <laughs> takes you a while to get there, but when you do, it's all there. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So. This, uh, I <laughs> appreciate this movie for what it's doing, but mm-hmm. I did not find this to be an enjoyable watch at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, <laughs> like, like I said, my, my memories of it were just this guy screaming at the woman and the woman being miserable the entire time. And I clearly didn't remember the part where the ghosts actually show up. Mm-hmm. And um, watching it this time, it was an equally difficult watch. I didn't, and I, yeah. I understand, I, I guess that's kind of the point. But I don't know. I, I don't, like I said, I, 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 more, I more appreciate it than I think I do enjoy it. Yeah, I can I can understand that. I don't think this is a movie that you pop on for fun. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. This kind of I kind of wanted to ask: Do you find this kind of thing harder to watch, or something more like like a say like a saw, where it's you know kind of just torture from end to end? Well, I get it wasn't like a hard. I wasn't like, um repulsed by it or anything i I, it just was not i didn't find it to be it was just very abrasive um and i i didn't i didn't feel like really enough was going on to to keep me interested to uh in spite of the abrasiveness Mm. It gets it once they kind of it kind of gets going a little bit towards the end. I feel like it's it, it starts to to pick up a little bit and things start to get interesting. Um, but yeah, the the for the majority of it, when it's just the two of them doing the ritual, it it seemed like a lot of the same scenes over and over again. Um, and I didn't super feel like they were giving me enough to keep me interested in in the story that they were telling at that point. But yeah. to answer your question, but to answer your question, I I don't I don't I don't find 
like I have no problem watching Saw movies. Um, mm. I, I think I think it's two different kind of feelings. I think between that and this, sure, and this isn't this isn't a movie that I would just never want to watch again because I I can't handle it or or it's it's too much or anything like that. I just didn't I just didn't find there to be enough um, story, I guess, to to get me through the abrasive elements. Yeah, I, th- I think that's that's a fair criticism of this movie. I, I think this movie has a difficult a difficult job to do mm-hmm. getting you from the sort of first act set up, settling in, establishing kind of the, the characters and the scene and the routine that they're going to be doing and then bridging that to get you to the third act and like the more climactic moments like when Mm -hmm. solomon gets injured and when weird shit really starts to happen in the house like i think that middle period of this movie has a tough job because you i think it is trying to do something with the fact that there's repetitions and there's cycles and the whole ritual itself is supposed to be repetitions and cycles Mm -hmm. So that feeling that you're seeing the same thing over and over again, I think is like partially intentional, but I almost wish they hit it a little harder. Sure. Do you know what I mean? Like, like I think like, I I think it was Oculus that did some of that. Well, that, that sort of like things keep happening or, or, or that sense of disorientation in like time and space. I wish this movie did a little bit more of that. Yeah, they 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 give it to you a little bit in the beginning. Like, there's that one bit where uh, I think they kind of like replay the exact same scene twice or something, right? Is mm-hmm. it when she's is it the first time she drinks the blood or something? Yep. They it like does a little bit of a time jump backwards and she does it again. And yeah, but she's um, aware of it. She's she's like saying, "But I just drank it." Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I I like that stuff when they did it, but it it just didn't it didn't it didn't really feel to me like it was building on itself um Mm. because you they would have a scene like that and then they would just kind of go into the next scene and they or or if something weird happened the the guy would be like well weird stuff's happening and then they would just (laughs) keep going and like it didn't it didn't feel like it was it was building in weirdness i guess um or or i guess at least the the characters in the movie didn't seem to recognize it as building weirdness. They seemed kind of nonplussed by all of it, which was kind of weird. It, yeah. Did you ever noticed, see... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that I, I noticed that too, and I think that's a fine uh, like <laughs> perspective to put Solomon in, but I wish, yeah, you had seen a little bit more of that sort of like mounting distress or uncertainty or concern coming from Sophia of like okay I'm doing this and I guess this is what I wanted but oh now this other shit's happening is is this really what I wanted like you don't get to see much of that from her Mm. I was just gonna say uh, have you ever seen the changeling with um George C. Scott I have not no uh it's I think it's on the list if it's not we're definitely gonna do it as one of the wild cards (laughs) because it's probably my favorite traditional haunted house movie and one of the most funny things about it it's not it's not meant to be a comedy but one of the things that's (laughs) it's tough not to smile at is george c scott is such a stoic actor Mm -hmm. or he can be and seeing him just sort of like be a part of these ghostly phenomenons that he just sort of is is very calmly being like okay well this is happening now it's just it's 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 (laughs) it's very fun to watch and it, it wasn't this wasn't quite it was a little bit different in this where it was like they weren't even really kind of acknowledging the stuff that was happening but for for anyone who hasn't watched it it's basically um <laughs> this woman contacts an occultist to do yes. a ritual which will she's which i guess is a real ritual as real yes. as these rituals can be it's from the book of abramelin abramelin i was wondering how you said that <laughs> um and with the intention of contacting her guardian angel which mm-hmm. will then give her the power to wreak vengeance on the people <laughs> who killed her son she gets a wish and he the occultist who helps her because he helps her through it also gets a wish 
Oh, well, that's that's convenient. Yes. I mean, he's getting $80,000 out of it. Does he need a wish to? <laughs> that's, that's the real reason he reveals later on that he's even doing it. Mm, yeah. That was actually my favorite scene in the movie, I think, actually, when... Yeah. When he starts talking about his reasons for doing it and and uh I think I think his line is something like the point is to know or something like that. He just he just wants to No, he wants invisibility. That's what it was. Yes. Uh yeah. but it's not like not like uh cartoonish invisibility. He just wants to be right. able to disappear from the world kind of thing. Um uh, but he yeah. get they get into his motivation of why he wants to do it and why she wants to do it. I, I think that was the strongest scene for me in the movie. Yeah, I so I have like very mixed feelings about both of the characters in this movie, which is I think mm-hmm. actually part of the reason I kind of like this movie. Mm. Um because neither one of them is very good as in terms of being a good person. Neither one of them are really I mean, I'm not, it, it's tough because it's like, they're not necessarily good people, but they're not completely bad people either. Sure, sure. And I think that speaks to that abrasiveness that you that you were talking about, where they are both very abrasive personalities, they're abrasive people, and this whole movie is pretty much like, what if you take two very messed up people and put them under intense stress? Mm. And... I don't know, and I th- I think that the the turns in their characters keep me interested. Where this movie kind of lost you, because mm. they do sort of seesaw back and forth between these moments of of almost camaraderie and almost tenderness towards each other, and understand like they approach understanding so often, and then something happens to cause them to backslide into kind of sniping at each other or just general aggressiveness that's like a flaw that they both have and can't get past even mm. in the midst of this crazy ritual and yeah i don't know there's there's definitely scenes to answer my own question that i posed to you a little while ago there are a couple scenes in this movie that i find harder to watch than like a like a saw movie mm. Um, like the the one where he tricks her into like stripping for him and essentially he like without touching her sexually assaults her. Yeah, that's it's kind of hard to root for that guy at all after that point. <laughs> yeah, but it's complicated because then there are scenes after that point where he is kind of like he does move back into this position of not being this horrible like he, they're there i just find them very complex characters which i find very interesting yeah i think i think the thing honestly that kind of turned me off is i found his performance to be um i think in order to make that kind of character really engaging for me anyway you have to Put, he has to get across the stuff he's getting across, like the severity of the stuff that he's getting across and how serious everything is, in a way other than just screaming at her. Because yeah. it turns into just kind of sounding like a drill sergeant. And like the, it feels like the, the more serious he's trying to get, the louder he yells. And I don't really feel like that's very effective where a different performance might have been able to pull out someone someone with a little bit more um, stage presence, I guess, let's put it that mm. way, uh, and a little bit more command of, of, of the screen might be able to pull out that, that level of uh, uh, gravity without resorting to just screaming at her all the time. Because by the yeah. third time he did it, it was just kind of, it just <laughs> kind of felt very samey to me. Well, it's, but at it's the same... Inter- Oh, I was just going to say, but at the same time, it's like he's, I don't know, he's clearly a, a guy who's kind of all over the place. So I guess it doesn't not work. Yeah, and I I do wonder, and I might be like reading into things and trying to justify it in my head a little too much. Um, but I do wonder, because it, it does seem so kind of performative and, and showy, like he is 
doing it on purpose most of the time just to jar her, like just to kind of freak her out and get her to just do what he's saying rather Mm -hmm. than because he's actually angry enough to be yelling at her. Do you know what I mean? It seems it seems yeah. almost like he's doing it like more as a technique to just get her into the right headspace or to just do the thing um, rather than because he's actually that feeling that like rage all the time towards mm, her. But yeah. I, don't, I don't know. Maybe that's not. Well, maybe I think that's you're not right. Quite right. I think he's very much is acting like a drill sergeant where yeah. he's not actually. I mean, he probably is angry to a certain extent because. Yeah, he I understands. think there are certain scenes where he definitely is yelling at her in a genuine way. <laughs> yeah, he understands. He understands the severity of the stuff that they're doing, um, but that isn't. It's not just pure rage that he's yelling at her. It is. It is more of a motivational thing. I did want to ask. I don't mm. know if if they really if they really set this up at all. But one of the one of the things I, I was kind of pulling out of his approach was I was wondering if you thought they were trying to imply at all that he might be full of shit. Hmm. Because he is so, so kind of weird and kind of abrasive and over the top and like reluctant to do stuff. And I, I, I ultimately, I personally ultimately don't think that they are, but I, I I couldn't tell if they were trying to go that way. Personally, I don't think so. I I think given sort of his his certainty and his kind of like the the way the movie shows that he has this depth of knowledge and he has mm. all these handwritten journals and notebooks and I think his reluctance to even do it in the first place sort of positions him more as a figure who knows like like you said like he knows the stakes. Mm. of this undertaking and i i yeah i i didn't really get that vibe but honestly the (laughs) the main reason i started thinking that was because he was so performative in places and also that one scene where he goes to town and just like prints a bunch of stuff off the internet (laughs) oh (laughs) so i was like wait a minute is he just like bullshitting this lady but i mean i don't think you commit to uh eight eight months living in a house uh well, I mean, he is getting eighty grand out of it, but um, yeah. if, if it's if it's a scam, then he he committed full force to the scam. Yeah. <laughs> of of becoming an angry English Alejandro Jodorowsky. <laughs> um, you know, the thing I really did like about this, though, and when I said I appreciate it more than I enjoyed it, the thing that I appreciate the most is I really, really like that it's a magic ritual that mm-hmm. isn't easy. Yep. And like legitimately cost something to do instead yeah. of just being let's find a magic book, stumble our way through some words and all of a sudden the monster the ghosts show up. It was like, yeah, y- you have to you have to work for this, which makes perfect sense because what they're doing is trying to contact a different plane of existence, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yes. You would think that 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 costs a little bit of energy to do. Right, as opposed to the films where people do it in about five minutes. Yeah, or accidentally yeah. even, you know. Oh, right. <laughs> Just Ash picking up a book. Although I, I do, don't get me wrong, I do appreciate those. But, oh, of uh, course. But of course. I, I did really like that this was a ritual that you you really had to want it to get this to work. Yeah, and you had to jump through all of these hoops and like... Something that I think I like about this movie is that it this movie takes itself extremely seriously. Yes. Like this this movie has the right tone and and hits those marks in the right way for somebody whose motivation for doing this is my child was kidnapped and murdered and I feel yeah. like it's my fault. Like Yeah, it's not it's not exactly a, a light subject at all. Yeah, but it doesn't ever like and and I do think, you know, this so this is an Irish British indie film. Mhm. Um and, you know, that means that there's a lot of like Catholic and Christian baggage. Mhm. <laughs> Coming from, 
you know, especially like, you know, just Irish heritage. Not as much, not as mm -hmm. much as in a Spanish movie, as we already established, is the Spanish movies always end up (laughs) being somehow like Catholic demon related. That's true. Um, But I, but I, I think I kind of like that this movie takes the discussion of like God and demons and angels and, and, and religious faith and just treats it very, very seriously. Like there's no, I don't know. There, there's nobody who comes along and is like, Oh, you know, God, that's not real. And then they fall down right. the well conveniently. And everybody's like, see, that's what you get. Like there's, there's none of that kind of like <laughs> yeah. playing around with it. It's just like, no, we're going to like, let these characters grapple with these beliefs that they genuinely hold. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, what I find really interesting about it actually is, and doing a little bit of uh, research on, on what the actual, actual ritual was. Um, The ritual was from the uh, book of Abermelon, as you, as you said, Mm -hmm. uh, which was something that was used by the hermetic order of the golden dawn, which was, yep, a secret society that was a uh I, I don't know if Aleister Crowley was a part of it or or if he I don't think he was a leader of it but I think he was involved with it at some point he splintered and, off before he started uh Philema. yeah there we go and <laughs> he and he actually I mean yeah you should be telling this part of the story not me <laughs> no, no and please, he I'll actually just he actually tried to do this uh ritual but he didn't finish it for some reason um, but what it says is the text describes an elaborate ritual whose purpose is to obtain the, quote, knowledge and conversation of the magician's guardian angel. Preparations are elaborate, difficult, and long. Uh, the, the German text describe a duration for the operation of 18 months before any divine contact is known. Uh, there's another version that only has it lasting six months. Um after the preparatory phase has been successfully completed, the magician's holy guardian angel will appear and reveal magical secrets. Once this is accomplished, the magician most e- must evoke the 12 kings and dukes of hell. I should be using like a better voice for this and I could put some <laughs> creepy music behind it. All right, come on, come on. Once this is accomplished, the magician must evoke the 12 kings and dukes of hell, Lucifer, Satan, Leviathan, Belial, etc., and bind them. (laughs) Thereby, the magician gains command of them in his own mental universe and removes their negative influence from his life. Further, these spirits must delve a number of familiar spirits, four principal familiars, and several more associated with a set of magical word square talismans (laughs) provided by the Abermelon Book 4. Um, My favorite Duke of Hell is etc. Yes. (laughs) He's just got, he's like short and he's got big glasses and he's constantly Yeah, pushing what do you want? Nose. Yeah. The magical goals for which the demons can be employed are typical of those found in Grimoire. The practitioner is promised the ability to find buried treasure, cast love charms, the ability of magical flight, and the secret invisibility to list a small number of examples. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Wikipedia text does not always translate into a uh, uh, creepy voice reading. Yeah. Um, but w- the reason I wanted to read that was because I find it interesting that a group that seems to be not really Christianity based mm-hmm. has rituals that use a lot of Christian imagery. Uh, they're talking about angels they're talking about lucifer satan all of the stuff that comes out of the bible um and i never realized that it was that it it's it's it seems weird to me because usually like this kind of stuff i feel ends up being fairly um uh less specific to a religion and a little bit more like agnostic based sort of Mm. um or maybe that's not the right word but i I'm surprised that there are so many uh, Christian references baked into it as opposed to just demons that are not really non-denominational demons, I guess. <laughs> well, all of these things are based off of like, and, and that's another thing I find interesting about this movie is that like so much of the things that they're doing, 
this this the the person who wrote this the I think the director was was the writer as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, he didn't make this shit up. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> like these all are are in existence. Like you know, numerology and Gnosticism and Kabbalah and like this sort of general undercurrent of like Christian based mysticism is a thing that has been around for you know a few couple thousand years, pretty much as long mm. as there has been Christianity there has been this undercurrent of mixing Christian theology and symbolism with like just, you know, I don't know if you want to call it magic or Satanism or like whatever, but all of these things are just kind of out there. They're, Mm. they're around. And it's, I don't know. I find that really interesting that like, yeah, this isn't something you would think of being like, like a real book. (laughs) It's just hanging out like mm. a real ritual that a bunch of guys tried to do. Yeah. And I, I guess my surprise, and I'm sure this is a conversation that's above both of our pay grades for this kind of stuff. But mm. my surprise is that I always kind of pictured this sort of ritual uh, magic as being anti-Christian to a certain extent, like in reaction to organized religions. Mm. So to see it using so much of that uh language i do find surprising but given how old they are i can see how they their their basis is more born from that stuff than it is an actual like legitimate rejection of it where it's not like the church of satan where they are rejecting uh, uh denominational religions and stuff it's it's more born from that than than it is rejecting it outright. Yeah, I, th- I think that's actually a really good way of summarizing a lot of this stuff. Not that not that I'm some sort of like knowledgeable expert on it, but like what little I do know is that a lot of it is these sort of early Christian sects that said, "Oh, you're not doing it right," or "There's so much more to this than we believe," and and, and sort of veered off into their own directions. Hmm. But um, I think the one of the big successes of this movie is the way that they do portray the ritual itself and the amount of information they give you about it. Because the exposition element of this is handled very, very well. Yeah. It's not too out there. It's not like... It's not like there's a scene where he's like, okay, listen up. This is what we're going to do. And like yeah. spells it out. He, th- There's an element of understanding that these two have at the beginning about what they're going to do and how they need to do it. And they talk about it as though they both have that understanding. They're not, mm-hmm. they're not going out of their way to, to, to bring everybody into the, into the, the show here. And they, the, the writer clearly has an understanding of what all this stuff is but is choosing to show them doing it rather than telling you what they're doing, which allows it to remain kind of mysterious and at arm's length, which I really like. Yeah, I do too. Where like, you know, our, our two characters are both very much like they've both done their homework. They're, they're both insiders in this sort of like realm. And so they talk to one another the way that like you know you could have a conversation with another musician in a way that would make total sense to you and the other musician Mm -hmm. and other people who are musicians but for me as somebody who does not have a musical bone in my body i would be very confused Mm -hmm. and i think there's that interesting like like when any two people from an in-group communicate with one another there's that that sort of pattern and i think it's it's impressive the way that this movie does that in a way that still can keep you curious and interested and like makes it feel mystical, but not so overwhelming that you're just like, Buh, now it's complicated and I don't understand what they're trying to like, what they're doing. Like, yeah, the goal this... is always really clear. The steps that he tells her, like you have to do this now, or now it's time to do this. Even when it starts getting a little like wobbly, like when mm-hmm. you see them do it, it's, it's like, oh, okay, she has to sit in this circle and read this thing, and he's going to go, like, 
Like there's no <laughs> there's no like chanting in ancient Aramaic and stuff like that. Right. The the one scene where I uh, my eyes started to glaze over a little bit was the scene where he was explaining the circles and the squares and stuff. I was like, mm-hmm. I don't know. He's dumping a lot of stuff out right now that ultimately like I didn't mind it that much because ultimately it, it didn't really matter that much. He's just sort of like going through this section of the steps. It's not like the stuff he's laying out is really important to the plot or anything. Yeah. Uh, except for, I well, I guess I guess technically it is because what he's laying out is he's like this needs to happen. These three things need to be activated, and the guardian angel will show up in this circle, which is ultimately what ends up happening. Yeah, but I, I think what that sequence does, like the purpose that it serves in the movie, is to sort of like a establish the reason behind his presence, like. Mm-hmm she's clearly really smart she's clearly also done all sorts of research and reading on this stuff she's consulted other occultists before she talked to him you could kind of ask like all right if she's that desperate why doesn't she just try to do it by herself Mm -hmm. but having him come in and give all of this very Hmm? which he says to her at the beginning he's like you know how to do this do it yourself yeah and, and and i think that's like that's a question that you ask even as an audience member. And then I think having him come in and spell out all of these really (laughs) specific convoluted, like the meanings behind this, this circle is the void and this circle is the, you know, what, what the song and like this circle is this, um, kind of like tells you the person watching it, like, all right, this is why she needs this guy here because Mm -hmm. she's, she, this is complicated. This is like, dangerous it's dangerous like spiritually it's dangerous for her health like somebody else needs to be there um i think it also helps establish the fact that this (laughs) this ritual is complicated and it is going to take time and effort and commitment it's not something that she's she's not entering into it lightly Mm. yeah um so for most of the movie it's the the ritual being done and the ups and downs of that and whatnot and they as it goes on they start to weave in a little bit more um uh what's the word I'm looking for spiritual presences that end up <laughs> becoming very very apparent at the end I as I was watching this I kind of felt myself thinking back to the innkeepers a bit because hmm. um, it's the same kind of setup where you've got two people searching My for other something. wild card. Yes. Well, it's interesting <laughs> because I really liked, I loved the innkeepers. I really, really yeah. liked the innkeepers. And I was, tr- I've been trying to think about like, what's the disconnect? Like, why did that work? And why did, did this one not really work? And, um, one of the one of the things I was thinking about was the end. The weird thing about this is, like, if you were listening at the beginning of the show, if you're listening, I it probably sounded like, oh, I didn't like the movie until all the ghosts showed up and all the weird crazy stuff started happening. <laughs> I would argue that I don't know if the ghosts work in this. I think it might be too much. Um, yeah, because the. The, the the stuff they give you before that, I think they backload it too much. Like, they start giving you the really weird stuff. It feels too late in the game for to really get me with it. But, like, I thought the shadow guy smoking the cigarette in the chair oh, yeah. was way more effective than any of those, like, mud people yeah. they, that, <laughs> that show up and just start, like, scratching at her and apparently use bolt cutters. Which I've never seen. I've never seen yeah, a ghost a use a one. bolt cutters before. <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, it's tough because I think the sort of like the mud people, as you called them, the demons, whatever you whatever you want to say, I think you they could have used those more sparingly and had them work better. Mm-hmm. Like I, I actually like. I really like when when she tries to leave the house. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah, she ends up just like kind of walking through 
they're they're in Wales and they're in the middle of nowhere. And she ends up spending essentially the whole day walking through this beautiful but desolate countryside until after walking kind of straight down the road, she ends up back at the house. Mm -hmm. And when she goes into the house, clearly something has been happening while she's gone Mm. because Solomon dies before she leaves. Yep. And then his body ends up at the bottom of the stairs when she comes back and there's like a pile of vomit. Um, And it looks like somebody either vomited on or had tried to eat and then vomited up a picture of her son. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's all this, you know, some of the rugs were moved. Some like the house is starting to kind of rapidly decay. And a lot of that you sort of notice when she comes back. And I like... Kind of like that, starting with that and then the next several minutes where, like, she's sitting on the stairs with just a candle next to her as it gets dark. And she's just sort of staring down at where Solomon's body is now laying on the floor. And then an arm just reaches out from the darkness and pulls him into it. And she gets up. Yeah, and she gets up and turns around and walks up the stairs, like, (laughs) (laughs) which I love because she's not an idiot. She's not like, she doesn't leap up and scream. She also doesn't try to go chase the thing and be like, what was that? Now I have to go see. She's like, all right, okay, this is happening. I'm going to get out of here. Like, I'm going to go upstairs. I'm going to shut myself in my room. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that stuff with, like, the shadow people and the sort of more subtle like voices behind doorways and the dog barking. Like I, I like that stuff a lot. Yeah. I, I find that stuff to be more successful than the, than the, the crazy element at the end, which is, I, I kind of, in the flip side, looking at the innkeepers, I thought the end of the innkeepers was very successful yeah. because I think they they roll the ball down the hill enough that they keep everything kind of ramping up ramping up ramping up and get you to that end point and it doesn't really go overboard like there's really only like one ghost messing around maybe two in the innkeepers that that kind of are driving the girl to her final fate there yeah. um it felt a little less restrained here um and by by restrained I mean like it 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 felt like it was a, flailing a little bit um as far as how to get to the end point which is her actually apparently completing the ritual because the guardian angel shows up and is yeah. this giant like uh uh <laughs> ghost of ghost of christmas present from um <laughs> a christmas carol giant yeah. glowing armored person who shows up hunched over in this tiny room which i thought was very cool and i thought it was cool that uh they didn't you didn't hear what it sounded like when it talked yeah um because i i I, uh it reminded me of there's a movie an old silent movie called haxon which Mm -hmm. is all about like the history of witches and stuff like that it's it's a it's a it's a narrative movie but it's talking about the history of witches whether or not it's true or made up or whatever but and uh <laughs> satan has a plays a role in the movie and at one point someone was the, the director was doing a q and a Q&A, and someone said why did you do this as a silent movie when you made it sound was a thing like it it was they were making sound movies but you decided to to not do it in sound mm. why did you do that and he said well one of my speaking roles is the devil what is that <laughs> what does that sound like i can't give him yeah. a voice that would be satisfying <laughs> to anybody yeah there's there's no way to come up with a satisfying representation of what a literal the literal biblical devil sounds like or in this case a literal angel um, so the choice to do it silently, I thought was, was very cool. Yeah. And to like show the, the house sort of like shake. Yeah. When it happened, I thought that was kind of a nice touch. So, you know, that like, I don't know, it, it, it emphasizes that this is not a sound that like human ears are able to hear. Right. Right. And, um, at that point I did want to talk about this cause it, it's, uh, she 
is confronted with or or presented with this guardian angel and the idea here is that she gets a wish um which always sounds strange when it comes to this stuff saying you get a wish like it it, it, it that, that yeah. terminology feels like incongruous with with magic and religion and stuff but right um, it's more like you know you got a a, a lamp and a genie and right right <laughs> Um, and up to this point, she has said that she, uh, she's, she's had two other answers for why she's doing this. The first answer, which was a smoke screen, was that she had uh, lost someone's love and she wanted to get their love back. And then when she's right, I believe, is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah. It was like, I love somebody and he doesn't love me or something right, like yeah. that. And then when she's pressed on it. She says what she wants is vengeance for her son who died. And then at the end here, when she actually is presented with the means to that end, she chooses to ask for the power of forgiveness. So she's actually pressed on it a couple times. There's the first there's the first lie where she says it's for love. Mm-hmm. Um, which... <laughs> Solomon has some sort of rejoinder for that and I'm not going to say it right but it's it's like do it's probably do, something like oh it's for love well you got a boyfriend you don't like anymore you won't like him again is that what it's about <laughs> it's not about fucking that it's serious business it's the short version of that which is some which is something like like doing you this think ritual- this is a fucking game <laughs> My apologies to all my uh, all of our English listeners. I was going to say you just alienated like a bunch of people. <laughs> um, no, he he says something like doing this ritual to force love is like getting Titian to decorate a fucking cake. Yes, yeah, yeah, <laughs> or something like that. Um, well, so that that's her first reasoning, and then when he presses her on it, she says it's because she wants to talk to her son. Right. Okay, I forgot about that one. Yeah. And he's like, oh, okay, that kind of love. All right, fine. And then when shit starts going real wrong, he's like, you've been lying to me. What have you been lying to me about? And she finally admits, it's not that I just want to talk to him. Uh, I want vengeance. Like, I want revenge. And that's mm-hmm. when he has to then drown her in the bathtub. Yeah, I forget. <laughs> Why does he have to do that to, like, cleanse her or something? Yes, because she pretty much, I think by her lying, it's the, like the internal logic of this ritual is that your intentions, like, there's a huge focus on purity, which doesn't mm. mean goodness. It means like a focus of intention and you have to right. be like, you know, like 100% driven and 100% correct in that drive, like that, that that that's what you're really doing or whatever. And because she has lied about it and they've gotten so far into it with her lying, she has to be like reborn so that she can be reborn in, in line with her intention or something like that. I don't really Mm -hmm. get it. (laughs) Yeah. You know, it's funny. Um, There's a, a, a screenwriting structure theory that I, that I've come across. I forget where it, which thing I read it in. That talks about the around the 50 minute to an hour mark in a movie or roughly the halfway point in the movie. Mm -hmm. um, Your main character will either get the thing that they're after, but not in the way that they thought they were going to get it. Or there will be some sort of death. And almost I've, I've tested this in a lot of movies. And most of the time, if there's a character in the movie who's a prominent character who dies, it's almost always at the halfway point. It's very interesting. Huh. It's, it's clearly something that people pay attention to. And this one, I hit the pause button right at that moment. And that was the halfway point, roughly, or an hour in, whatever yeah. the, the option was. I forget. But it was in this case, it was the actual death and rebirth of the main character instead of a side character that spurs the spurs the uh, the main character on. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, that is, that is interesting. And like, just to, to go back a little bit to the what you're talking about with Solomon and, and his yelling and how it's like <laughs> supposed to be like uh, it's his attempt to be like intimidating and, and scary. But you were saying it's kind of frustrating that like when he gets angry or when he's trying to do that, he's got one mode and that mode is yelling. Mm -hmm. 
I think the scene where he gets her into the tub and drowns her, he's much more frightening in that scene than any of the scenes where he's yelling. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, he... he's just like drunk and so- like, but like somber and very calm. Yeah, he is a lot scarier in the moments where he is quiet. Yeah. Uh, Because he's got that sort of like serial killer quietness to him. Like even the scene right before he uh, sexually assaults her via projection. I don't know how else you would describe that. Yeah, I don't know. Um, It's a very like, it's one of those scenes where he's like clearly focused on something and he's being very quiet. And then the next scene is him just telling her to to disrobe and all this kind of stuff. And it's... uh, um, Yeah, so him him being quiet is is a lot is a lot scary. I was thinking about it. Um, I think I would have bought this performance if it was more if it was like Bob Hoskins. Bob Hoskins <laughs> was the the king of being scary while yelling at people, especially with like a thick English accent. That guy is was terrifying. Great actor. Yeah, I won I wonder though, not not to harp on this one issue too much, but I wonder how much we are actually supposed to find him scary when he's yelling. Sure. Yeah. Cuz I I think kind of the point is more that like he's unstable maybe. But I I don't know. I I think there's enough sympathetic moments with his character that part of the point is that it is that this movie doesn't want you to be 100% alienated from him. Sure, sure. So, I don't know. Yeah, I guess I kind of wish that they had played him a little bit more um, erratic. Like, they had give you give you a little bit more in the, in the realm of she doesn't know this guy and she's about to submit to this crazy ritual that may or may not end up with him killing her or something. Or You know what I mean? Where, yeah, that's that's an interesting point. Like, there's there's kind of lost opportunities for some like, uh, passive but frightening lurking. <laughs> like, yeah, like things like that. You don't know if this guy is a serial killer. She doesn't know if this guy is a serial killer. We, who knows what his actual intentions are? Is he sane? I don't know. He's talking about contacting guardian angels and shit who knows what you know what i mean like i i I feel like there yeah there was the opportunity to kind of lean into that stuff and and have their relationship be a little bit more in question uh as Mm. to whether or not she was in multiple forms of danger yeah that's that's interesting too because like you, you brought up the innkeepers earlier and i think that this is a good parallel to that as well where there is that one sort of very unsettling moment in the innkeepers where the main character goes up to her coworker to the room that her coworker is is mm-hmm. taking his nap in and when she knocks and, and and opens the door he's like in there in the dark mostly undressed and it's shot in this way that's like you have this moment when you're watching it like ooh wait a minute it, yeah. is he a danger too did did we take this guy for granted <laughs> <laughs> like right, we don't really right. know him he's this older guy she's alone with him in this place like yeah it definitely plays on that uncertainty and i i think you're right that this movie could have done that as well yeah yeah i think i think that would have gone a long way for me anyway um so yeah when she when she meets the angel she asks mm-hmm. for the power of forgiveness and i was wondering do you feel like she has earned that <laughs> i it i I don't know. She got the the other guy killed. Uh, yeah. She broke the circle she wasn't supposed to break. She lied about her intentions to get to do this in the first place, like deep into the ritual. It's kind of weird to me that it works and she gets what she wants at the end. I, I think it's supposed to be an example of maybe not getting what you want, but getting what you need. Sure. I, either either way. I mean, it, yeah. You could say she well, wants vengeance, but what she needs is forgiveness. But ultimately, she gets it. And I don't know if I totally buy her getting it, like deserving to get it. I guess. I, I get. I get what you're saying. Like it. It does feel like it goes pretty quickly from her kind of stubbornly committing to this path. And even the fact that, like, like so, 
her drinking the him having to cut his vein open and pour her a glass of blood wine is because she says i don't do forgiveness right so her whole anti-forgiveness stance is like established early on and they have to jump through all these additional hoops in the ritual for that stance because she will not par- participate in forgiveness. Right. I do think there's an interesting, like, there's a moment where she's talking to the demon or the spirit or whatever that's using her son's voice. And she keeps saying, like, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. And the voice asks, are you asking me to forgive you? Mm-hmm. And she says no and kind of recommits like I'm going to get the people who killed you. I'm, I'm going after them. I'm going to I'm going to make them pay or something. Mm. And so it's there's it's interesting because this whole like the concept of forgiveness is so important in Christianity. And it's clearly very important in, in this movie. It's kind of an undercurrent running throughout the fact that she can't she can't forgive others, but she also can't forgive herself yeah yeah so it's it's all there and it's all interesting but i get what you're saying because then it's like a a a switch is flipped really really late in the game where she's come she's gotten a finger cut off and she's come to her realization that vengeance isn't the way and forgiveness is what she needs Mm. and yeah it does feel like (laughs) maybe maybe she should have had to do something a little bit more Maybe she should have had to go through a little bit extra. But at the same time, like, how much more running through the house being chased by mud people could she have done? Sure. I guess I guess my thought is I don't know what it is that clicks her over into the forgiveness zone. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I agree with that. Because I was wondering. She says I. she says that she, I believe she says that she wants the power to forgive. Is that the phrasing she uses? I think so. And I was thinking, do you think it's intentionally vague as to whether or not she's talking about her forgiving herself or forgiving the, the people who killed her son or some combination of the two? I, I think it's the kind of thing that you have to assume goes hand in hand. Mm hmm. That like so much of her, so much of her desire for revenge and her need to punish, her need to punish others and her need to punish herself are all like too intertwined to be distinguished. Mm -hmm. Because they, there's even, um, when, when she talks to her sister who she sort of, I, I, I kind of never really, not to jump topics too much, but like, I, I don't really get that scene where she like runs into her sister in the parking yeah. lot of a grocery like completely store randomly yeah <laughs> yeah and it seems like they haven't spoken in a really long time but also she's been very upfront with like hey i'm doing this esoteric <laughs> ritual so that i can get at my son's killers don't try to stop me hmm. um god I, I forget where i was going with this well, that scene she, in general, it feels like it's in there to hammer home her intention. Because um, that, that's yeah. where where it really kind of comes out as to what happened to her son and, and why she feels the way she does and, and the route that she's been going on. Which, yeah, it's, it's, kind, mm. of, it's kind of superfluous because I, I don't know if you necessarily need it. I kind of remembered why I brought it up. Um, mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure <laughs> that... In that conversation, it's revealed that Sophia was in some sort of uh, hospital. Mm, yes. Like like that she was essentially uh, an inpatient at a mental health facility and only recently got out. And like her sister says something about like, well, you know, when, uh, up until you were in the hospital. And she said, I was sick because I was in the hospital because while I was there, I couldn't do anything. Like now I'm doing something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so... There's this whole idea that after her son was 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 kidnapped and murdered, that she's just been on this downward trajectory of like 
blame and punishment and guilt mm. the, the, like the whole time like that the things she's been through even before this movie started maybe count towards what she's going through now mm. i don't know that's a yeah. thin justification <laughs> yeah yeah the other thing i was thinking about with this movie is uh um did you ever see a movie called bug with um michael shannon and ashley judd oh god remind me it's ashley judd it's been forever since i've seen it but like the 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 main thrust of it is that ashley judd hooks up with michael shannon and michael shannon turns out to be like a paranoid schizophrenic who uh thinks that there's bugs crawling on everything and the movie is about her coming basically uh uh, is it Munchausen by proxy, I guess is the, the, the thing where she starts believing the stuff that he believes. Oh no, that's, um, like a fully ado, right? Sure. I, I, it, it's, <laughs> I don't know the technical term for it. What is, what's Munchausen by proxy? That's when, um, that's, that's sort of like, I think to like very much simplify it, it's almost like hypochondria but you use somebody else as the the patient so it's like a, a mother always believes that her child is sick and sort of makes up symptoms and and demands treatments for all these different ailments for their quote-unquote sick child oh. who's actually fine okay yeah it is it is folly ado. i just looked that up yeah. you know i i don't know where i came i came across that recently and i don't remember where um, do? Yeah, I, something I was reading or watching or something was talking about it, and I don't remember the context, but I have definitely heard that recently. Anyway, that's yeah. that's what it is. And so <laughs> she starts she starts taking on the delusions of Michael Shannon about you know these these bugs getting into everything and all that kind of stuff. And I I was kind of expecting this to be something like that, mm. where maybe where she starts believing the intensity of the stuff that he's bringing and you're not quite sure whether or not the stuff that they're doing is real you know what i mean that kind of thing um yeah and i guess yeah i guess just to, to round it out i was i was saying i don't know if the end is too much but i i, I almost might have preferred it if they didn't go that big at the end and and kept it a little bit more restrained and and a little bit more up to the imagination I, I agree that would have been my preference as well, having, you know, more shadow guy, more creepy little kid voices behind doors, fewer mm. people with body paint. Um, yeah. But I think if they were going to go in that direction, I almost wish they had gone a little bigger. You know what I mean? Like, mm. I think the way they hit it in the last, like, 10 or 15 minutes, it, it almost gave you, like, like the worst of both worlds yeah yeah like I, I wish it was more or way less <laughs> yeah yes yeah well i was thinking you know uh, to to it, to use the language of the witch i feel like the shadow guy should have been like the black phillip scene like yeah. you know, that's kind of like the climax is when she's finally presented with something semi-tangible that she can confront and, and have, have some sort of interaction with. Um, and then the rest after that, it's kind of falling action. Um, yeah. But I mean, it's, this is all me just like trying to ha hammer this thing into something that I like more, but <laughs> it's, it is, I do, I do think it's a very interesting movie. Um, I, after talking about it, I could see myself going back and giving it another, another watch. But it's not one I would put on while I was doing something else. No. Because uh, it's not a great... And, and honestly, that was part of the reason why I didn't like it the first time. Because I think I put it on while I was working. And mm. it was just not coming through. Um, but yeah, I would say it's worth a watch. Uh, if you like yeah. stuff that's a little bit more... Um, uh, how would you describe this movie? And would you recommend it? <laughs> well, uh, I can. I, I'll, I'll start with the easy one. I I would recommend it. Mm -hmm. I do think it has some some interesting ideas. 
some interesting moments, some really great scenes between the two characters. I love, like we said, the, the shadow figure with the cigarette is a really great one. Um, I would, so part of the reason I think I like this movie so much is because sometimes I enjoy just like sitting in an ambiance. Sure, sure. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, Oh, totally, yeah. Yeah, I just, I, I like all the sort of complex esoterica and all the weird ritualized stuff. There's something about it that appeals to me. If you're into any of that kind of like that end of horror with like demonology and rituals, if you're into any of that, if you're into like kind of claustrophobic spooky house movies, it, it's good for that kind of thing. If you're looking for more of a traditional horror movie with like a very specific or frightening monster, this isn't really your thing. Mm. You know, as as you were talking about, I was thinking about what I recommended, and I think I I think I would recommend it to a very specific audience. Like if I knew you were on the save wave <laughs> save same wavelength as like I am. Mm-hmm. I would say, check this out. Would mm. I recommend this to like someone who just re- said, what's a good scary movie to watch? Probably not. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> and as I was thinking about it, I, w- I realized, you know, if this movie had a killer soundtrack, I probably would love it. Because <laughs> it's like, I just watched Gretel and Hansel. Which I, mm. we should probably do at some point, just to be, because it would be fun to talk about. Yeah. And that's another movie which is very, very sparse dialogue, um, not as quite as sparse of a story as this, but it's a fairly sparse story. But the photography is absolutely amazing, and the soundtrack is also absolutely amazing. And I think for a movie like this, for me especially, if you've got just like a killer soundtrack, that does a lot of heavy lifting for me. And really kind of allows me to to sit back into that pocket you're talking about of just the, mm-hmm. the ambiance and, and the and the goings on, as it were. Um so I think that's kind of because I was as I was watching it, I was like, this there's not really much not really much music in this to really speak of. It's, it kind of <laughs> See, pops I, in. I like the soundtrack in this. Like I I yeah. like what, what music and sort of instrumentation there is i like it i think it fits yeah. really well with the the general vibe and the environment that they're kind of building yeah yeah that's fair yeah yeah um to each to each their own i suppose yeah this this movie is for um giant nerds <laughs> 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 if you're really into books and you use the word ontological in conversation this film is for you i'm a awesome. pretentious asshole um would you put this would you put this movie on our list if you could you know i i don't know that's a tough one for me because i do think that this is an interesting movie i think it's kind of doing some stuff that i i don't really i can't really off the top of my head think of think of a closely comparable like film so in, in a way I, I wish it was on the list because i think it's its uniqueness is is kind of interesting in the kind mm-hmm. of horror movie canon but at the same time this is a list that leaves off like friday the 13th right yes so I, this movie was was named the 46th best film of the decade by vulture Oh, wow. Yeah. So there is a lot of critical love for this movie, which makes it that much more surprising it's not on the list. Um, and if it were on the list, let's just, I'm just going to look real quick while while we're doing this here. Um, if it were on the list, it would be, uh, <laughs> it's tough. It's tough because there are some movies that are in the nineties that are, that are actually lower than some movies in the 80s mm. uh, because of how this thing works. But um, This list is bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Let's just say it, it had like, a, I think it said it had a 92. I think so. It would probably be uh, at least 
in the high, or, the, or I should say the low 100s. Uh, when do things get consistently in the 90s here? 90, 93, 95, 92. So yeah, if you're going by just the percentage and consistently in percentages here, it would be 91, probably be about number 90, 91, 92, I think. Huh. <clears throat> I mean, that that's... That is interesting. This that's kind of surprising because I I do feel like I am in the minority in liking this movie as much as I do. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm just sort of surprised that there's such a a general positive consensus around it, at least critically, if not audience wise. Mm. Mm. This list is so confusing. Yeah, I've given up trying to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> So I think that's going to do it for Dark Song. Uh, I've hit the randomizer button. Beep, boop, boop, beep, boop, 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 boop. And next time we will be jumping up to number 30, Ooh. which has a 92% same score as this. Number mm. 30, which is Cabin in the Woods. Oh, fun. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. I've only seen that. That's a movie, you know, if I had seen that movie when I was maybe like, 10 years younger it mm-hmm. would probably be one that i could recite front to back <laughs> you know it's just got it's got that sort of um Joss Whedon. yeah not even that so much but like it's got <laughs> well it does have that element but it also it's just got yes. that like that army of darkness kind of kind of tinge to it where it's just really fun it's really memorable it's, it's mm-hmm. i remember it being fairly like quotable and stuff I think it would have been a big movie for me if I had been about ten years younger when it came out. Yeah, it it, it hits it hits that meta part of the genre too that I think you enjoy. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, and it's also cool. man, they 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 set up they set you up for an ending and they deliver on that ending. I I can't. They do. Can't say that enough. That's true. Um. So yeah. Th- uh. Thank you guys for listening. Oh, also, uh, we have our first episode of coverage of friday the 13th up on our patreon so if you want to check that out you can become a patreon member subscriber whatever you call it by going to patreon.com patron patron, there we go (laughs) by going to patreon.com slash the penske file you can you can find all that stuff over there uh thank you guys for listening as always thank you for joining me amanda thank you for having me clay and we will see you guys next time bye everyone Thank you.